If you were a fan of Five Nights at Freddy's during the early days of the series, then you may be familiar with a small indie game that went by the name of 123 Slaughter Me Street. 123 Slaughter Me Street was an indie horror game that was created by only two guys, Nate Sanders and John Jolbeck, which released September 28th of 2015, most likely made as an attempt to capitalize on the attention that the Five Nights at Freddy's series had been receiving. Now you may remember this game due to YouTubers such as Daco and Fusion Z Gamer covering it, as it was traditional for them to cover these types of indie games at the time, but was the game actually good? Did it have the potential to become an iconic indie horror game franchise similar to say Poppy Playtime or Bendy and the Ink Machine? Well, I recently stumbled across this game again on my Steam library while looking for something to play, and noticed that this game hasn't received much coverage on YouTube at all. I really wanted to find out if 123 Slaughter Me Street was an overlooked gem of the indie horror game genre, or if it was just a quick attempt to cash in on Five Nights at Freddy's success. So I took it upon myself to complete the game and see how it really was. And with that being said, I present to you the 123 Slaughter Me Street Retrospective. After the large success of Five Nights at Freddy's, indie horror games had been changed forever, with a sort of new genre being born from the game. This genre would usually involve the player sitting still trying to defend themselves from mascots while trying to survive a certain amount of time. Now 123 Slaughter Me Street definitely does take cues from the Five Nights at Freddy's series when it comes to its gameplay, but it also spins it on its head in a unique way that I think if executed better would have actually been a very engaging gameplay rhythm that could have set the game apart from other horror games coming out at the time. Essentially you start on the 7th floor of a building and you are given the task of making it to floor 1 and escaping. You will do this by walking down the hallway while trying to avoid 3 different haunted puppets. Each floor kind of serves as how a night would be in the Five Nights at Freddy's series, with the entirety of the game taking place within just these 7 floors. During almost each floor, a new gameplay feature will be introduced to keep the gameplay engaging and give the player a new challenge to adjust to. On the 7th floor, you will need to deal with the follower. The follower is a big blue puppet that will appear behind you. He will try to chase you as you make your way down the hallway. You are able to stop him however by turning around and flashing your flashlight at him. So you will need to make sure you are flashing him enough times to make it to the end of the hallway before he catches you. For floor 6, the follower is now gone and we are introduced to a new character named the Greeter. The Greeter's gameplay works like this. Basically there are these doorways that will be on your left and right as you make your way down the hallway. Now the greeter has a random chance to stick his head out of these doorways as you are walking past them. And if you accidentally walk into him, you will be jump scared. To counter him, you will need to stop in front of the doorways and flash him with your light. Seems easy enough, however once we start seeing floors with multiple puppets at once, you will soon see how he can be a major disturbance to your run. For floor 5, you will need to make your way down the hallway while trying to avoid both the follower and the greeter. This is where the pressure starts to set on you as you will not only be trying to run away from the follower as fast as you can, but you will also need to move extremely cautiously as to not run into the greeter. Now for floor 4. In this floor, you will notice that the follower and the greeter have become much more aggressive, especially the greeter who will appear much more often now, usually around every 4-5 to five doors you pass. I really like the idea of being able to take the risk of running past a door, trusting your gut that the greeter won't be there in order to buy yourself a few extra seconds to gain distance between you and the follower. However, this floor's obstacles do not stop there as we are introduced to a brand new puppet named the waiter. The waiter Later is the third and final puppet that we are introduced to in this game, and it's probably the easiest to avoid out of the three. Now that I think of it, I have never actually seen his jump scare because he didn't even kill me once. Anyways, the waiter's mechanic is that you will hear him growl, and upon hearing the sound you will need to flash your flashlight into the nearest hallway to stop him from walking out and killing you. This can get very tense at times when you know that the waiter is in a hallway, but you are unable to shine him because the greeter has peeked his head out of that same doorway. The waiter does however give you a very long time to shine him before he actually kills you, 
which makes him very easy to avoid. Getting towards the home stretch, we have floor 3, which is the same as floor 4, just with more aggressive puppets. Towards this point in the game, I had sort of developed a pattern that allowed me to complete these floors with ease, basically just by using one strategy, which does seem to be a major issue in this game. The gameplay feels as if it is almost RNG based. You do not have much say over what happens during your run, so my strategy basically consisted of me running up to a door, shining my flashlight, turning around, and I would just rinse and repeat this at every door. And if I ever heard a growl, I would just quickly shine the hall and then turn around and shine the follower. Now this strategy did not work 100% of the time, but it did almost 80% of the time. And with each floor taking less than a minute or two to complete, with no real delay between attempts, I found myself just throwing myself at the levels over and over again until it felt like the RNG of the greeter spawns pretty much just allowed me to clear the stage with ease. I feel like the game really needed more puppets than just three to really spice up the gameplay. I see it as such a missed opportunity, as the first four floors of the game really had me invested, with having to learn new puppet mechanics in order to pass the floor. For floor 2 and 1, they are again just the same as floor 3, with the 3 puppets difficulty and spawn rates increasing, especially on the final floor where the greeter would spawn almost every other door. However, with my pretty much foolproof strategy, I was able to complete the final floors in just a few attempts. The game only took me around 30 to 40 minutes to beat, which was a major shame, as I had up to this point been sold on the premise of the game. And with a Steam asking price of $4.99, I expected a lot more gameplay than just 30 to 40 minutes. Now the game does try to offer some form of replayability in the form of these collectibles, however for me they were just not a good enough incentive for me to go back in and play again. Now they do go into a little bit of the backstory on the character we are playing, however I just wish they would do a little bit more with these collectibles. Maybe some sort of audio logs or text documents could have benefited the game greatly and would have helped greatly with setting up the world the developers were trying to create with this first game. Overall, I think that the game gameplay style had a lot of potential. I really like the sort of fake first person mode where yes it is first person, but it is only controlled by a few buttons. I think for what they were, the puppet mechanics worked good and were implemented in good ways. I just can't help but feel the game desperately needed to bring a new member of the cast with each floor, to make the game get progressively more chaotic until eventually the final floor is an absolute mess of puppets trying to kill you in various ways, making you juggle all their mechanics to make sure you survive and make it out alive. I also think the game could have benefited from making the floors longer, with more unique elements to differentiate each floor, as they all just feel like reskins of each other. This makes the building you're in feel more as if it's just a backdrop for the gameplay of the puppets, rather than an actual environment that your character is trying to survive in. That's really all I have to say about the gameplay, but next I want to talk about the audio design, before jumping in with the visuals and story the game has to offer. Now this game has very little in terms of audio design, however I still want to comment on it mainly because of one mechanic in the game, that mechanic being the waiter's growl. So remember earlier how I was talking about the waiter's growl and how it would tell you where he is located? Well this is where the devs kind of made a huge oversight, as the waiter's growl is just one sound effect within the game, which doesn't make it clear which side it is coming from. That means that if there is a door to your left and a door to your right, you will have to check both because you cannot hear which direction his growl is coming from. The way the audio is mixed makes it sound as if it's just coming from the center of your screen, essentially making the audio cue ineffective. Now it is still needed to alert you if the waiter has spawned in the hallway, however I just wish that it would be more clear which direction he is in. Also another sound effect I found weird was the footsteps of the follower. It is never really clear how fast he is moving or how close he is to you. However, because you will just be constantly checking behind you, it's not really a big deal and won't get you killed most of the time. One final sound effect I want to comment on, however, is the jump scare noise, which I just don't find scary at all. 
I'm not sure if it's the fact that since these levels are so short, you will be getting jump scared over and over again, a lot more often than the Five Nights at Freddy's games, but this sound effect just gets old very fast. Now, I would give it to the devs, they did include two versions of the sound effect in the game to make sure that it's not completely identical every single time. However, I do still find the sound when you get jump scared extremely repetitive and not very scary at all. Some positives the game has when it comes to sound design, however, is that it actually features some voice acting upon booting up the game, which gives us a little bit of insight on the story and was a very nice addition I think. It really helped set the scene for the game and I'm glad that they threw it in there. The game also does feature this voice assisted tutorial mode which while small is a nice inclusion because I was completely lost in terms of the controls when I first attempted the floor 7. But in terms of the ambient noises, I feel like this game just needed more. I would have liked some red herring sound effects to be thrown in there during the nights, as I felt that I was way too confident walking down these hallways, and the game just made it way too obvious when there is a monster and when there isn't. Think of FNAF 4 for example. In that game, there is not only audio that you will need to listen to, but there is also random sound effects that will happen throughout the night. These play to throw you off and make you question your listening ability. This game has nothing like that, and with the waiter's mechanic being audio oriented, I can't help but feel that it would have been huge in terms of creating tension and anxiety during the player's experience. One last note before moving on to the visual section, I just want to say really quick that I love this floor complete music you get after every level. It reminds me a lot of that happy music you get after each shift in sister location, and it just feels so good to hear after after just barely escaping the puppets with your life. Now for the visuals, and I have a lot to say in this section. For starters, I just want to say that the artwork for the Steam page that I have on screen now is just absolutely phenomenal and really sets the tone for the game that you're about to be playing. However, as soon as you start the game, you will soon find out that the visuals have very little to offer in terms of creativity. For starters, I just want to talk about the character design. Now, while not bad for an indie game created by just two guys, I feel like these designs are a little basic and needed to be spiced up a little bit by the developers if they planned on these characters becoming solidified as iconic indie horror game mascots. Now, I know that these are based on Sesame Street puppets, and to the developer's credit, they do a very good job of representing that. I just can't help but feel that these characters needed a little bit more flavor to set them apart from just the generic, scary Sesame Street characters. In terms of actual graphical quality and not just character designs, I think that these characters, while not looking the best, do serve their purpose in representing the monsters in this game. I just feel like a little bit more attention to making the fur look real on these suits could have gone a very long way in making these puppets all the more realistic and terrifying, but I understand that these resources might have not been available to the developers at the time, so I do not hold this against the game. As for the actual three puppets in particular, I really like that they all have their own recognizable silhouette that will make them identifiable even when shrouded in darkness. I also like that they are given their own respective colors. I do feel like these characters did have interesting enough designs to potentially become iconic characters, but just a little bit more flair could have gone such a long way. Speaking of adding flair, this is something that the level design needed extremely bad in my opinion, which I just want to comment on again really quickly. I know that this game would have benefited so much from having each floor look different. With each floor looking the same, you just get so desensitized to it very fast, and you kinda just get tired of seeing the same old backdrop every level. I really feel like if the developers could have added some interesting floors with maybe some environmental gameplay features, for example, you could have a floor where the lights would flicker on and off, or a floor where maybe scrapped puppet suits were all over, or maybe a floor where there would be a more maze-like path instead of just going in a straight line. 
this could have added so much more diversity to the gameplay and would have actually made it feel like each floor you were going to was unique and would also give you the sense of exploration as you were exploring your way down the building, uncovering more of its hidden secrets as you make your way to the final exit. I mean, I know this game was made with a low budget and was made very quickly, but they literally used the same cutscene after every single floor. Like you mean to tell me that this bloodstain was on the same wall in every floor? This seems like such a huge oversight by the devs to ignore the actual environments of the game and I feel like this was possibly the second biggest flaw the game had other than not featuring more puppets that would try to kill you. Now to give the visuals a little bit of praise for a minute, I do want to say that I really like how dark and gritty they made the building and puppets appear. This game does not feel cartoony at all, which is a trap I feel like a lot of indie horror games fall into. A great example of this being Poppy Playtime. Now don't get me wrong, this game definitely does have amazing visuals, awesome lighting effects, all of that. However, something about the way the world is designed just feels so cartoony and light toned to me. This is something that 123 Slaughter Me Street does not have in my opinion. This building feels so dark and decrepit and this really does play a big part in how scary and threatening these puppets feel. One last thing in terms of visuals I would like to touch on is the intro cinematic. Yes, this game actually does have have an intro cutscene. Well, I don't know if I should really call it a cutscene, it's more of a comic in a similar fashion to the Security Breach alternate endings, and while it is just artwork and not actual animation, I think that's totally okay. With such a small team and budget, there was no way that they would have been able to have animated stuff, and I think that the comic book art style fits well with the overall tone and atmosphere the game sets up. It also does a good job of setting up the premise and allowing us to know the characters we are playing as. Which speaking of the story leads me to my final section of this retrospective. This just in. A Channel 12 exclusive report on the whereabouts of the missing Tim Denson. As many of you know, the once critically acclaimed Tim Denson was... Now the story in this game is extremely vague and gives us almost nothing other than the initial setup. However, it does leave me with a few questions that caught my interest upon my first playthrough. The game starts with an audio of a news broadcast where we learn that there has been a man named Tim Denson who had gone missing. We then learn that Tim Denson had been reported missing by his family after they had not heard from him in years. Many had believed that he had been residing at 123 Center Mill Street. We then learn that Tim Denson is globally known as the father or creator of a puppet that can be manipulated from within which essentially just sounds like the Springlock suits from the Five Nights at Freddy's series. And basically, while trying to contact Denson, his family had found out that his apartment complex had been abandoned and Tim had left everything at the complex due to his family not claiming his belongings. There were tales from locals about how these puppets would roam the halls of the apartment complex during night, searching for their long lost creator. Everyone in the presence of these puppets would be a target, especially people with dark criminal backgrounds. Now this never does get explained in the game, but it really does remind me of Five Nights at Freddy's 2 and how the toy animatronics in that game could detect criminals, so I'm almost certain that this was inspired by that. We are then shown a title screen followed by a comic. This comic shows us a man who is on the run from the police when he stumbles across Tim's abandoned apartment. In an attempt to escape the police, the mysterious man climbs on top of the apartment before falling through the weak flooring. Now I do have to say, I think while basic, this is an extremely cool premise for the game. We are this criminal who is on the run who accidentally just fell into an abandoned puppeteer's apartment, tasked with the goal of making it down all seven floors of the building to escape. I don't know, something about that just really caught my interest, which made it hurt all the more when I found out that this was pretty much all the story we had in this game despite a few small moments. One of these moments being the ending, which was extremely vague and does nothing other than set up a sequel or I don't know, just leave a cliffhanger. And yes, this game does actually have a sequel, so if you guys would like me to cover that next, please let me know down below as I am extremely interested in seeing how the developers attempted to improve the series. Anyways, after escaping the final floor, we see a cutscene of our character running out of the building before it catches on fire. We then see all three puppets kind of running towards the camera, and this moment just felt extremely left field for me, and honestly feels like it was just included for the devs 
for no other reason than to leave breadcrumbs that would be explained later in future games. Almost as if they didn't even know why they were adding it and just hoped that they would be able to explain it later down the line. Now I know that Scott would do this throughout the FNAF series with for example Golden Freddy or the purple guy, but those were just small character easter eggs. This is the actual ending of the game, and with the intro of the game piquing my interest so much, this ending was a major disappointment to me. The only other place in this game where we can get some actual lore are the relics or collectibles, and while they don't directly comment on the storyline, the objects that the relics embody can give us some hints into the crime that our protagonist has committed. These relics include a crowbar, a rocking horse, a doll, a dollhouse, and a children's book. Now I'm not entirely sure what this could mean, but it does hint that the character we are playing as is a criminal who had possibly taken the lives of children, similar to William Afton in the Five Nights at Freddy's series. Other than that though, there is no other story in this game. My takeaway from playing 123 Slaughter Me Street is that while the game had interesting ideas in terms of not only its gameplay and story, the few times the developers missed the mark severely dragged down the experience and stopped it from becoming a staple of the indie horror game genre in the same way that Bendy and the Ink Machine or Poppy Playtime has. And I can't help but feel upset that this series has been discontinued, as I think we could have had a really cool game on our hands had the developers put extra time and resources into making sure this was a more polished and content packed game before rushing it out the door to hopefully capitalize on Five Nights at Freddy's success. While the game does have some amazing gameplay concepts, cool characters and lore, and unsettling atmosphere, it's just not enough for me to look past the game's lacking qualities like its small cast of characters, repeated level design, and below average amount of content, especially for the price. Overall, I would probably still give this game a 6 out of 10 and would recommend it to any indie horror game fan to check out if given the chance to snag it when it's on sale or something. I'm going to have my overall rating for the game on screen now, and yeah, if you guys want me to review the second game, please let me know down below. If you watched this far into the video, I really appreciate you, and I know this is a little bit different from my typical Five Nights at Freddy's content, however, I feel like it's close enough that you guys will still be able to enjoy these types of videos. Also one last thing, I know that I took a little bit of a break, but I'm back now, so expect new videos hopefully every single week. So if you guys don't want to miss that, please consider subscribing to the channel. Anyways, with that being said, I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.